Hi, I'm Sat E. Nyangi. Welcome to Wrestle Talk News. And here's the top story. Happy Sat E. Day, everyone. Who wants some news about a major Survivor Series return that isn't CM Punk? Yes, despite being housed in Phil's backyard, according to Dave Meltzer in the Wrestling Observer newsletter yesterday, talks between Punk and WWE are dead right now. That is also despite Punk being recently spotted in Orlando, with Fightful Select confirming Punk was just there to provide his latest commentary for Cage Fighting Fury Championships. But fear not Chicago, as you could instead get the long-awaited 18 months in the making return of Randy Orton. Yes, just weeks after being spotted leaving the WWE PC, a place where all talent must work out before returning to action. Fightful Selected have revealed that targeted plans for Orton is a return at Survivor Series on November the 25th. BWE on Twitter also claimed that Orton has been doing great recently, with WWE taking a cautious approach to his health to make sure he's 100% ready for a return. Let us know how you would book Orton's return in the comments below. Moving from a return to a debut now. Last night saw former Impact and NWA World Champion Nick Aldis debut on WWE TV as he was appointed a new SmackDown General Manager. Despite Aldis seeming like a natural fit already, he could soon be joined by a former WWE star in a co-GM role, one that he is very familiar with. Because it's only his bloody wife, Mickie James. Yes. According to WrestleVotes, within the last month, WWE had thrown around the idea of a husband and wife of Aldis and James, both taking power over the blue brand. However, it seems that at this time anyway, that will not be happening. But hey, if it was an idea at one point, so maybe it could still happen. So watch this space. And we finish up with some follow-up to AEW president Tony Khan's social media antics that have turned many heads this week. According to Dave Meltzer in this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter, WWE saw Khan's post following NXT's ratings win over Dynamite on October 10th as a declaration of war, specifically after his statement on Undertaker and John Cena not being featured on a show with under a million viewers. But Khan wasn't done there as in a post reflecting on his mother's health scare a year ago and thanking Mayo Clinic for their work, he brought up WWE. According to Khan, the time his mum was in the hospital is synonymous in his mind with WWE due to him receiving calls regarding alleged talent contract tampering, saying that this is when business became personal for him. Khan then hit back at replies to the post from WWE Avatar accounts for turning their wrath to his mum's near-death experience. That's not all from Khan's ex-account as the AEW Prez also reportedly reached out to a fan regarding the controversial quarters promo from Juice Robinson to MJF on Dynamite. Travis Ackers, who is a DeVos School Board District 7 candidate, called AEW out for the angle, calling it tasteless for its leaning into anti-Semitism. In response to this, Khan reached out to Ackers via DM, but in the screenshots provided, Khan seemed to not validly address his concerns, instead just questioning Ackers' decision to quote tweet TMZ in his original post, saying, it's not doing much good. Akers did note to Awful announcing that he and Khan were having an ongoing conversation regarding his concerns. So uh, hopefully something good comes of all of this. Now guys, this week we do not have Tempest because he's busy doing Tempest business. But what we do have is the OG. I see you guys in the comment section. Where is Oli? Where is Oli? Guess what? I have Oli. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you the OG, the boss around this place. He is Mr. Oli Davis. And you know what? The camera goes black. It's Saturday. You know what that means. Well, it, it's, well, usually it's Tempest doing the Smackdown and Rampage reviews about now. I'm on Saturday. AEW was on Tuesday this week. What even is time anymore? Nevertheless, here's what happened on last night's AEW Rampage in one minute. One take. Hit the clock, sat. Ready? And you hit it. So it's game. Oh crap. Uh, um, uh, 
The, the disappointed and Jericho Society of Matt Maynard, Angelo Parker and Daniel Garcia defeated the Hardys and Brothers A to open the show. Maynard pushed Garcia afterwards for doing the dance. Hopefully, a sign 2.0 is getting a more serious push without Jericho. 3.0. Jay White set up a match against Penta for Dynamite. Jay Lethal beat Trent Barretta after Trent's leg gave out on him. Santana and Ortiz confronted each other, finally face to face backstage, but I just want them to be friends. Sky Blue beat Emmy Sakura with a sterner presentation for Blue since she got misted by Julia Hart, Dark Blue. Blue will take on Chris Statlander for the TBS title on Collision, and the main event saw Blackpool Combat Club's Claudio Castagnoli and Wheelie Utah beat the Embassy's Gates of Agony. Oh, ah! Time! 47 seconds, go you sir! It's an hour long show, it's, it's much easier to wrap up. Over in WWE meanwhile, it was a season premiere! What does that mean? Nobody really knows. It's not like there was a season finale last week, but compared to the empty season premiere marketing gimmicks WWE have done in the past, this episode of SmackDown genuinely felt like a soft reset of the brand, chiefly because Roman Reigns is back, everyone. The show can actually do worthwhile things again. Reigns was in the very first segment, interrupting the greatest of all time John Cena's promo in the ring. Whether the greatest of all time John Cena is in a WWE ring, by the way, is what I'm now using to let me know if the actor's strike is still going on. The greatest of all time John Cena said he's not here to challenge Roman, though. He has to earn that. But he knows someone who has, queuing up LA Knight's entrance to a huge pop. I don't review that many Smackdowns, so I'd just like to put over how incredible Knight's rise has been from being Bray Wyatt's scared jock fodder this time last year. Hell, shortly before this time last year, he wasn't even called LA Knight. It was called Max Dupree. While it took a while, it's a testament to WWE's booking under Triple H, going with the crowd momentum, as opposed to burying it because upper management didn't hand pick him. Most impressively though, Knight did not feel out of place standing across from Roman in the ring. His promo was confidently delivered, with Roman awesomely reflected in Knight's glasses. Great job, camera person! And he looked badass just swatting and ambushing Jimmy Uso out the ring. Not so good for Jimmy though. This set up Knight vs Solo Sokoa for the main event, meaning Adam Pearce yet again hadn't booked a main event for his show before it went on air. I'm glad he's been replaced. Elton Prince made his triumphant return from injury, with him and Kit Wilson putting over his Elton Strong resilience, which seems awfully familiar to Roderick Strong's next strong act in AEW right now. I guess that's just another one for the crazy coincidences pile. After putting over how strong he is throughout the match, Prince excellently faked an injury to lead to pretty deadly beating the brawling brutes. Carlito didn't get to do the thing. As the Street Profits jumped in before he got to bite his apple, Bailey quickly beats Elena Vega, which was mostly just an excuse for Charlotte to do the lowest effort save possible, running down the ramp with the pace of your mum doing a 5k park run. Just days after reports emerged that Triple H had fully replaced Vince McMahon in charge of WWE Creative on Endeavor's request, Triple H made his first appearance on screen in months to announce a new authority figure will be running the flagship show. Again, just one for the crazy coincidences pile. There's nothing more to read into there. It's like getting your father-in-law boss of the company extinct dinosaur skull as a gift, or calling all your developmental shows takeovers. There's absolutely no meta subtext going on here at all. It helps that a lot of Hunter's key decisions have been spot on though. After putting over Adam Pearce for being one of the longest authority figures ever, in, in sort of duration of doing it, not not length, of height. Triple H announced he would be getting a promotion to Raw General Manager. I was quite confused whether that was actually a promotion because I, I forgot what Adam Pearce does. This in and of itself was very interesting. Just five years ago, WWE wouldn't be able to help themselves. Vince or Stephanie or even Triple H would run Pierce down saying he wasn't doing a good enough job. That's why they're bringing someone else in. They'll have to do much better, neutering a babyface who'd never get their receipt. Here, Triple H presented upper management as a united front, presenting WWE for the first real time since the Attitude Era as a babyface run promotion. Because instead, the smarter booking is to put all that heat on wrestlers who fans can actually get excited to see wrestle a match and get beaten up. Enter Dominic Mysterio almost on cue to massive boos, which Triple H couldn't resist a meta joke for, saying that is loud, he always thought the boos were piped in. Dominic complained, so Hunter said he'd have to take it up with the new general manager of this show, SmackDown, and rather unceremoniously introduced former NWA and Impact World Heavyweight Champion Nick Aldis. 
who just walked in from ringside with no music or anything. It was an oddly low-key presentation, but actually probably the right call. As fantastic as all this is, the majority of WWE viewers will have little awareness of him. This allows him to come in with no expectations, which he'll easily blow away in the coming months. In fact, it happened right away, with an immediate burn on Dom, saying he's a big fan of his dad, and then finally announcing who the trade pick the other way is after Raw got Jey Uso, Kevin Owens. A bittersweet move, as while it will hopefully mean a main event singles repackaging, it comes at the expense of his latest Sami Zayn reunion, which never reached its full tag team title run potential. And then backstage later on, Aldis really announced he'll be doing things differently around here, by giving Charlotte Flair a women's championship shot next week. <laughs> this is how she's gonna come down. But even that criticism was instantly squashed as Flair turned round right into Jade Cargill, providing one of the three awesome stare down match setup visuals on this episode. The other two came after the following match of Jey Uso and Cody Rhodes easily dispatching Austin Theory and Grayson Waller. On walking up the ramp, they came nose to nose with Solo Sokoa and Jimmy Uso, starting a heavily loaded tag title feud for Roman Reigns to top them, walking out afterwards to have a one on one stare with Cody, with Aldis putting his between them in the exact same physical manner you'd see in an MMA or boxing weigh-in. Aldis's big fight field presentation has always been my favourite part about him. This led into the main event of LA Knight Wrestling, a John Cena match against Solo Sokoa, complete with being worked over for the first half and ragdoll selling. So much so, an actual John Cena appeared and intercepted Jimmy Uso's interference for Knight to beat Solo for the win. Knight then turned around into a rain spear, who awesomely did the LA point before raising his own finger to acknowledge himself. A terrific episode, introducing Aldis, setting up the huge matches of Roman vs Knight, Cargill vs Flair and Bloodline vs Jay and Cody, and teasing the WrestleMania main event of Rhodes vs Reigns. This week's Smackdown is 85%. But now a very exciting announcement because Fantasy Booking Warfare is back on Parts for Known right now! Go watch the first match of me vs Sat booking the Hurt Business reunion by watching on. Welcome to Fantasy Booking Warfare! Our Fantasy Booking Spectacular returns as eight gladiators will battle in this single elimination tournament in head-to-head -to -head competition. Each episode will feature its own...